All right, Chemistry 111. We're going to continue on with gases tonight. This is Chapter 5 in the Chang textbook. And what we covered during our last lecture was basically four different gas laws. We started out with Boyle's Law. You can barely see the words Boyle's Law, but this is Boyle's Law here, which is P1V1 is equal to P2V2. You have to know Boyle's Law. So basically, Boyle's Law is that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. If you increase the pressure on, the, on a gas, what's going to happen? The volume will decrease. If you decrease the pressure on a gas, the volume is going to increase, right? Next, we look at Charles' Law. Now, our book um, uses Charles' Law as a descriptor for both of these formulas here. I kind of like to separate them into what I call Charles' Law, which demonstrates that volume or how volume and temperature are directly proportional to one another. If the temperature of a gas is increased, its volume is going to increase. If the temperature of a gas is decreased, the volume is going to decrease. And then Gay-Lussac's law shows the relationship between pressure and temperature. It's also a direct relationship, like Charles' law, in that if temperature increases, pressure increases. If temperature decreases, pressure decreases. And then lastly, we looked at Avogadro's law, which is a really interesting one. And it shows us that volume is directly proportional to the number of particles of a gas. And that seems to make sense because we think, well, if we have particles of gas, you know, they're going to take up some space. And so the more gas we have, the greater volume that gas is going to take up. And you notice that if you look at each one of these, Avogadro's, Boyle's, Charles, and Gay-Lussac's law, all of them are direct relationships except for Boyle's law, which is an inverse relationship. All right. So if we... Put all those laws together, okay, we can develop this expression right here. Now, you might be wondering, where the heck did that come from? Well, if we look at these, okay, we can put them all together to make this formula here. You can see that we have Boyle's Law is in here. You can see that we have Charles' Law is in here. You can see that we have Gay-Lussac's law is in here, and then you can see that Avogadro's law is in here as well. And we're going to talk about this formula more a little bit later, but this is basically just putting all four of those formulas together, and we see how pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature are related. So it says here, if you take a sample of gas and um, the pressure on it is doubled and the temperature is tripled, by what factor does the volume change? How much is the volume going to change? Well, first of all, we have a sample of gas and we're not changing the number of moles of that sample of gas. So N is, N is constant, constant. And so we can shorten this formula if we remove the N to P1 times V1 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over T2. Now, what they're telling us is that we're, again, doubling the pressure. So the pressure is going to increase by a factor of two, and the temperature is going to increase by a factor of three, right? It's tripled. Well, if we started out and we said that our P1, V1, and T1, if we just said that they're all one, just give them all the number one. This is our P1, V1, and our T1. And we said that our P2 is going to be double the amount. We're trying to determine how much the volume changes. and our temperature, sorry, what does it say here? The temperature is, tripled, yes, sorry. The temperature is tripled. Well, now we can work this out, and what would we do? We would multiply this side by three and multiply this side by three, and then we get that two times V2 is equal to three because these are going to cancel out and therefore v2 is going to be equal to three halves or 1.5 times so the volume is going to increase by a factor of three over two again all we did was put the Boyle's law Boyle's law Charles law and gay Lussac's law together to come up with this law and this law is what we call the combined the combined gas law, okay? 
then it's a good idea to know the combined gas law. Well, if we want to try using that um, formula again, it says here, if the pressure of a gas sample is quadrupled and the absolute temperature is doubled, by what factor does the volume change? So this question is in the exact same vein as the last one. We see that we have a gas sample. So that tells us that the number of moles is going to be constant, right? We're not going to change the number of moles. Was anybody able to work this at one out? Can anybody tell me by what factor the volume of the sample is going to change? Is it going to double, quadruple, be 100 times? Yeah, thanks, Christina. Absolutely. It's going to be a half. So this is how Christina figured this out. She said, if I assume that my initial pressure, volume, and temperature, if I just give them the number one, so I say one for each of these, and this is the simplest way to solve these kinds of problems. She said, well, the pressure is quadrupled, so that means it goes up by a factor of four. I'm looking for the second volume, or V2, and the temperature is doubled, right? It tells me that right here. Um, temperature is doubled, pressure quadrupled. Well, there we go. Now we can multiply both sides by two, or multiply this side by two, and then we get that four times V2 is gonna be equal to two. We divide both sides by four, and we get that V2 is equal to two over four, or V2 is equal to a half. And so our volume is gonna change by a factor of a half. So it's gonna decrease by half the amount. Well, let's talk about what's called the ideal gas equation. Again, if you took the time to read the entire chapter um, or the remainder of the chapter before you came to class today, you saw this formula down here, which is called the ideal gas equation. You have to know this equation moving forward in this class. PV is equal to nRT. You see all, it described in all manner of ways on the internet. Some people call it Fouvenert or whatever. Depends, maybe you've seen it in high school, maybe not. But if you're wondering, where does that equation come from? If that's not clear to you. Well, if we describe Boyle's law in terms of volume, right? If we know that pressure is inversely proportional to volume, we could also write that equation as volume is inversely proportional to pressure like this. We know that in Charles' law, that volume is directly proportional to temperature. In Avogadro's law, volume is directly proportional to the number of moles. So I can combine all three of these where I have my volume and I can say it's proportional to N, the number of moles, times the temperature divided by the pressure. Okay, but remember, this is just proportional to. So a more correct way to do it, not more correct, but a way that we can work uh, this out numerically to solve for a volume is that we have the volume is equal to some constant multiplied by nt over p. And that constant is what we call r or the gas constant. So the gas constant, r. I will provide you with the gas constant for your exam. You don't have to memorize it. However, if you try all the practice problems that I've recommended and that I've provided the solutions for, if you do all of those, I promise you, you're going to have the, the um, the gas constant memorized. And there are more than one gas constant, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But before we discuss what the gas constant is, and it's and it's here on the slide, I want to show you where the gas constant comes from. Okay. First of all, we have to dis discuss something called STP, not the Stone Temple Pilots, but standard temperature and pressure. In chemistry, we define standard temperature not as room temperature, right? You might think standard temperature, that must be the temperature of a room around 25 degrees Celsius. No, in chemistry, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, and standard pressure is one atmosphere, or the pressure at sea level on the planet Earth. So STP is temperature is zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. What's zero degrees Celsius in Kelvin? Well, if you remember how to convert from temperature in degrees Celsius to temperature in Kelvin, you add 273. That will work most of the time. But on this slide here, they added 273.15. So zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273.15 Kelvin. All right. So if we have standard temperature and pressure, there have been many, many experiments done that are really interesting in that they show that one mole of an ideal gas 
is always going to occupy this volume. It's a good idea to have this volume memorized. I'm not going to give you this volume um, on the exam. You need to know that at standard temperature and pressure, one mole of an ideal gas takes up 22.4 liters, approximately, or 22.414. And you can see the size of 22.4 liters next to this basketball. What does it look like? Maybe double the volume of the basketball or something like that. So if we take that equation, that ideal gas equation that was on this slide here, and I asked anybody in the class to isolate R, you'd say that R is going to be equal to PV divided by NT. Well, the R, the gas constant, is standard temperature and pressure is going to be at a volume of, or sorry, a pressure of one atmosphere, a temperature of 273.15 Kelvin, right? Those are standard temperature and pressure. One mole of a gas occupies 22.414 liters. So we can substitute all those numbers in right here, and we end up with that constant. And we determine that R, or the ideal gas constant, is this right here. 0 0.082057 liter atmospheres divided by mole Kelvin. Oftentimes, when I'm using the gas constant, I won't report it to five significant figures because it's very rare that you're going to need five six figs in chemistry class once in a while but oftentimes i just use 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole k and i'll be honest with you a lot of problems can be solved with only three sig figs in which case it would be 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres divided by moles times kelvin all right so some interesting units so there we go. Pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles of an ideal gas are all factored into this equation that we call the ideal gas equation. It's important that you know what the units are, okay? That pressure is in atmospheres, not millimeters of mercury, not kilopascals, okay? Volume is in liters. Temperature is in Kelvin. This is a big one. Students will sometimes just want to turn everything into degrees Celsius, but the temperature must be the absolute temperature scale. So the one developed by Lord Kelvin. The number of moles is N, so that's the number of moles. And then our gas constant, of course, is 0 0.082. It didn't come out here, did it? 0 0.082. There it says 5.7, and here it says 5.8. We'll say 5.8 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. I just noticed there's a discrepancy there, the 8 here. And then I have a 7 here, but I promise you, that that's not going to cause any problems with anything that we're going to solve because we'll never be solving problems to five sig figs. I doubt a whole heck of a lot. All right, there we go. So now that we know all those units, let's see if we could solve a problem using the ideal gas law. So sulfur hexafluoride is a colorless and odorless gas. If you remember last lecture, I told you that sulfur hexafluoride is that gas that people can breathe in and it makes them sound like they have a really deep voice. Um, anyhow, colorless, odorless, due to its lack of chemical reactivity, which is a good thing because if you're inhaling it, you don't want it to react while it's in your lungs. Um, it's used as an insulator in electronic equipment. What's the pressure in atmospheres exerted by 1.82 moles of this gas in a steel vessel with a volume of 4.53 liters at a temperature of 69.5 degrees Celsius? So I am looking for the pressure. Right? They're asking me to calculate pressure. So I need to have volume. I need to have number of moles. I need to have the gas constant, which I already know. <clears throat> that one's easy. Okay, there we go. And I also need the temperature. <clears throat> well, let's write down what we know. We know that our volume is 5.43 liters. Liters are appropriate units because liters are in my gas constant. It tells me that I have 1.82 moles, also appropriate units because moles are in my gas constant. But it tells me that my temperature is 69.5 degrees Celsius. There are no degrees Celsius in my gas constant, and therefore I need to convert that temperature into Kelvin. So I'm going to add 273.15 to it, and you get a temperature of, let me grab my calculator here, 69.5 plus 273.15, and we get 342.6. So three, no, it would be 342.7, wouldn't it? So 
Yeah. 342.7 Kelvin, like that. Okay, so now we have our volume. We have the number of moles. We have our gas constant. And we have our temperature. Now we can solve for our pressure. So pressure is going to be equal to nRT over V. Let's plug in some numbers. We have 1.82 moles multiplied by R, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, multiplied by our temperature, 342.7 Kelvin, divided by our volume, which is 5.43 liters. Let's double check our units. Liters cancel, moles cancel, temperature of units of Kelvin cancel, and we're left over with only atmospheres, and our pressure will be reported in atmospheres. So make sure you can use your calculator and do this kind of question properly. You want to solve the numerator first, 0 0.0206 times 342.7 divided by 5.43. And when you plug all that spinach into your calculator, you should end up with an answer that has three significant figures. And I got 9.43 atmospheres. Okay, there we go, 9.43 atmospheres. So there is a direct application of the ideal gas law. Again, you have to have memorized, okay, memorized. No ACS final will ever give you this equation. PV is equal to nRT. They will just give you the gas constant and assume that you know um, what the correct units are, liters, moles, Kelvin and atmospheres that you would want to use for your volume, number of moles, temperature, and pressure, respectively. All right. Well, if you found that one a little bit difficult, the next few slides I have a, um, that cover the same problem, but we go through the problem step by step a little bit slower. And the only reason I do this is to kind of make sure that we can get everybody on track on the same page. So if you weren't with me 100%, Follow very carefully, and we're going to walk through a problem one step at a time. Okay, so imagine you're on your, your next exam, exam three, or the final exam, and you're faced with this problem. It says calcium carbonate, which is a solid, decomposes when you heat it to produce calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. There's a nice, lovely balanced equation for you right there. It says a sample of calcium carbonate is decomposed, and the carbon dioxide um, collected so in the carbon dioxide collected in a 250 mil flask, okay? After the decomposition is complete, the gas has a pressure of 988 millimeters of mercury at a temperature of 31 degrees Celsius. The first question we wanna answer is, which variables do we have? Well, we have 250 milliliters, which represents a volume. So we have a volume. What else do we have? We have the pressure of the gas, which is 988 millimeters of mercury. So we have a pressure. And we're also provided with the temperature of the gas. So we have pressure, volume, and temperature. And so we have these three right here. Okay, we're not done yet. Next question is, and this is the exact same question that we just looked at, but it's asking me now, for which variables do I need to convert to a different unit? Well, remember that the gas constant, and even if you don't remember it, I'll write it down for you, is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So that tells me that my volume is in the correct, it's in the units of milliliters. So I'm gonna need to convert that to liters. So must convert to liters. My temperature, or sorry, my pressure is in millimeters of mercury. I'm going to have to convert that to atmospheres. And then finally, my temperature is in degrees Celsius, and I need to convert that to Kelvin. And so the answer is pressure, volume, and temperature. Everything needs to be converted into different units. So we got a lot of work ahead of us. Again, how did I know that I needed to convert those based off of the units in my gas constant? Okay, next question. What is the temperature? The temperature is, of course, 31 degrees Celsius. Nothing mind-boggling there. 
And then it says, what is my pressure? Well, we have 988 millimeters of mercury, okay? Sorry, this last one here, it says, what is my temperature? I, I went over a little too quickly. Maybe I should have said, what is the temperature that I would use in my formula is probably the way I should have phrased it. So we wouldn't use the temperature in degrees Celsius, although that is the correct temperature in degrees Celsius. We want the temperature in Kelvin. So our temperature in Kelvin is going to be equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15 Kelvin. So our temperature in Kelvin is going to be 31 degrees Celsius plus 273. I don't need the two decimal places because of the sig figs that I have, right? This is an addition, so plus 273. And that gives me a temperature in Kelvin of 304 Kelvin. So my temperature in Kelvin is 304. We'll highlight that. Okay, next to ask me, what is my pressure? Of course, it's 988 millimeters of mercury, but I need to convert that into what? Into atmospheres. So let's do that. If we have 988 millimeters of mercury, we can use the conversion factor that in one atmosphere, we went over this in the last class, there are 760 millimeters of mercury, the famous experiment done by Evangelista Torricelli. And we get that the pressure in atmospheres is, is 1.3. So technically it should be 1.30, it should be three sig figs, but whatever, Anyhow, close enough. So we have 1.3 atmospheres. Next it says, what is my volume? Well, my volume is 250 milliliters. That's the volume of my flask, but I want that in liters. And I know that in one liter, I have a thousand milliliters. So I simply divide that by a thousand and I get 0 0.250 liters. And so that is the size of my flask there. And so um, why are you not asked to calculate a value of R? Because we know that R is a constant. So we have everything that we need to solve this problem, okay? It's asking me how many moles of CO2 were collected. Well, let's solve the equation and solve for the number of moles. So if we have PV is equal to NRT, we can solve that oops, for the number of moles and we get number of moles is equal to PV over RT. I'm going to do the math up here. We get the number of moles. It's going to be equal to our pressure, which was 1.30 atmospheres times the volume, which is 0 0.250 liters divided by R, which is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin multiplied by the temperature, which was 304 Kelvin. And let's double check our units. Liters cancel, as do atmospheres and Kelvin. And we're left over with moles in the denominator of a denominator, which would render it the numerator. And then when we punch all that into our calculator, we get that the number of moles of carbon dioxide, and I'm gonna double check my math. You might wanna Hopefully you're following along with me with the calculator and double checking my work here. So we have 1.3 times 0.25 divided by 0.9 times 304. And I end up with 0 0.0130 moles of CO2. And so that would be um, answer A. Now that was kind of slow. It's kind of a sluggish way to solve a problem, but hopefully, um, just by looking at that and kind of taking it step by step like that, it kind of gets you into the rhythm of, okay, I need volume in liters, I need pressure in atmospheres, I need number of moles, I need temperature in Kelvin, so on and so forth, all right? So with that in mind, let's try looking at another problem. It says calculate the volume in liters of 7.40 grams of ammonia at standard temperature and pressure. Well, if we're going to use... PV is equal to NRT, and we're looking for volume, we'd say that volume is equal to NRT over P. All right. We know R is the gas constant, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We know our temperature, right, standard temperature and pressure 
is when we have a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 273.15 Kelvin. And we're at standard pressure, right? STP means you have a pressure of 1.00 atmospheres, right? This is STP. Now, there's one thing that's missing, and that's the number of moles. They haven't provided that for us, but they have provided a mass, right? They gave us the mass of the ammonia. Well, how would I figure out the number of moles, oops, the number of moles of, of my ammonia? It's going to be equal to the mass divided by the molar mass of ammonia, right? Because mass is in grams. And molar mass is in grams per mole. And I've been given the mass in grams, and I can calculate the molar mass by looking at my periodic table. Now, I've gone ahead and done that already. I looked up the molar mass of ammonia, and I determined that the molar mass, we'll just call it mm, is equal to 17.03 grams per mole. There we go. So if we want to figure out the number of moles, we've got 7.40 grams divided by 17.03 grams per mole. 7.4, and we get 0 0.435 moles. Like that. Okay. Uh, yep, looks good. So now we have all of that. Okay. So now we can solve for our volume now that we have everything we need. We have our, we have our temperature, we have our pressure, and we have our number of moles. So let's plug in some numbers. We have that our volume is going to be equal to 0 0.435 moles times the gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, moles times Kelvin, it's a constant, the gas constant times temperature, which is 273.15 Kelvin. Again, you could have used 273 since there's only three sig figs in here anyway. Um, divided by our pressure, which is 1.00 atmospheres. We'll double check our units as always, and we see that moles cancel, temperature units of Kelvin cancel, pressure units cancel, and we're left over with liters. So if we take 0.435 times 0.2036. And we end up with a volume of 9. So I ended up with 9.75 liters. Like that. 9.75 liters. All right. Is there another way to solve this problem based off of your knowledge? Does anybody know if there would be another way to solve this problem that might be simpler? Is there a relationship I could use? And there's nothing wrong with the way that we've solved the problem. Does anybody have an idea if there might be another way? Well, let me ask you a question then. Based off of everything I taught you, could we use Avogadro's law to solve this problem? Could we use V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2? Would that be possible, do you think? And it's not a trick question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Branson. I agree with you 100. Branson says, sure, sure, you could go for it. You could solve this using Avogadro's law. Now, if you're like, well, how the heck could I do that? Well, if you have the number of moles of your ammonia, which is 0 0.435, then let's think about it. Let's say your volume <clears throat> at standard temperature and pressure, we know that the volume of 1.00 mole of a gas would be 22.414 liters. I showed you that a few slides ago, right? I said that at standard temperature and pressure at STP, one mole of a gas takes up 22.414 liters. So what would 
the volume be when we have a standard oops, standard temperature and pressure, but when we have 0 0.435, 0 0.435 moles? Well, you could solve for V2 and say that V2 is going to be equal to V1 times N2 divided by N1. And we'll just do it here very quickly. So we have 22, oops, 22.414 liters multiplied by 0 0.435 moles divided by 1.00 moles like that. And moles cancel out. So you just take 22.414 multiplied by 0.4. And you get that volume is equal to 9.75 liters. And so either way is perfectly fine to solve this problem. Again, the strategy using the ideal gas law works, no problem at all, okay? But since we know, and the only reason that this using Avogadro's law works so well in this problem is because it's standard temperature and pressure. We know that one mole of a gas is going to take up 22.414 liters, right? That's knowledge that we have as chemists. Okay, so a couple of ways to solve this problem. Let's look at another problem that I promise there won't be as many ways to solve, okay? It says here, if you have an inflated helium balloon, so some kind of helium balloon with a volume that's equal to 0 0.55 liters at sea level. So already we know that our volume is 0 0.55 liters when the pressure is 1.0 atmospheres, and then we allow it to rise up into the atmosphere until the pressure drops to about 0.4 of an atmosphere. So our P2 is gonna be 0 0.40 atmospheres, okay? Assuming temperature remains constant, what would the final volume of the balloon be? I have a question for you right away. I mean, will the second, will the volume two, will it be greater or smaller? just based off of your knowledge of what we've looked at so far. What happens if you put something in lower pressure? What's gonna to happen to the volume? If temperature and number of moles are gonna stay the same. All right, this is an application of what formula? This is boils. Boyle's law, right? And we know that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. That means that if the pressure is dropping, the, right, the pressure is going down from one atmosphere to 0.4 atmospheres. If the pressure goes down, the volume is going to have to go up. So we're going to solve for V2, but our V2 must be greater than 0.55 liters. If it's not, then we'll know that we've done something wrong. So let's work this out for V2. We get that V2 is equal to P1 times V1 divided by P2. Let's plug in some numbers here. Our initial pressure is 1.0 atmospheres and the balloon has a volume of 0 0.55 liters. Then it goes to a decreased pressure, which is 0 0.40 atmospheres. Look at this. The units of atmospheres cancel and we're left over with the units of liters, which are units of volume. So we take 0.55 and we divide it by 0.4 and we get 1.4 liters. We should only have two sig figs. So again, the pressure dropped and so the volume of our balloon went up. Excellent. All right, I can see all my students answered and they were all correct. Thank you very much, perfect. So again, what is this question applying? What law? Boyle's Law, again, I can't stress this enough. You have to have Boyle's Law memorized. You have to know that Boyle's Law is P1V1 is equal to P2V2. All right. Now, if you were to ever get confused and you say, I can't remember the relationship between pressure and volume or volume and temperature or something like that. If you're ever stuck on an exam, as long as you know pressure times volume is equal to NRT, as long as you know the ideal gas law, you can derive any of these, right? If, let's say, number of moles in the gas constant and temperature are all constant, now you see the relationship of pressure and volume. You see that pressure is going to be equal to something over volume. We'll just say pressure is going to be proportional to 1 over volume. 
if you did the same thing, for example, PV is equal to MRT, and you wanted to derive Charles' law, well, then you'd say, well, pressure, number of moles in R are constant, and you can see that volume is directly proportional to temperature, right? You could do the same thing, and you could say, well, if um, volume N and R are all constant, then I can see that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. And if you say, well, pressure R and T are, are all constant, then you can see that volume is directly proportional to number of moles. So again, from the ideal gas equation, you can derive Boyle's law, Charles' law, Gay-Lussac's law, and Avogadro's law. It's kind of a one stop shop. All right. Okay. Let's take a look at another one here, 5.6. It says argon is an inert gas that's used in light bulbs to retard the vaporization of the tungsten filament. A certain light bulb containing 1.20 atmospheres and 18, or a certain light bulb containing argon at 1.20 atmospheres and 18 degrees Celsius is heated up to a constant volume. Calculate the final pressure. Now this law that's shown right here, this is what I call Gay-Lussac's law. Our book just calls it Charles' law, that's no problem. But anyhow, what's the take home message from this law is that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. So you can see that if the temperature is increasing, right? If temperature goes up, what's gonna happen to the pressure, right? Our P2 should be higher than our initial pressure, right? These are the kinds of thoughts that you wanna have when you're solving these kinds of problems. And one thing I've learned teaching chemistry is that a lot of these laws are intuitive to my students. You know, even if they've never studied them there before, they think, well, if you have a pressure cooker and you turn up the, t the heat on the stove, the pressure increases, right? And the food gets cooked faster. Okay, well, the same rationale applies here. If we turn up the heat, the pressure should increase. Now, if I call this pressure my P1, and if I call this my T1, and I call this my T2, and I want to solve for my P2, so I'll do it over here. I say that P2 is going to be equal to P1 times T2 divided by T1. Can anybody tell me um, why I can't just start plugging in numbers right away? There's one problem here. All right. Houston, we have a problem. Can anybody tell me what the issue is here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Branson. Thanks, Warren. Yes, thanks, Jiang. Excellent. Kristen, everybody's correct, okay? You're all saying the same thing. He's like, do not leave these units, okay? I can't tell you how many times I've graded exams and had my heart broken when a student will leave in, you know, degree Celsius. They did the math right, but they put in the wrong units, and they'll circle an answer, you know, that has the answer derived from degree Celsius. So we have to convert these to these temperatures into Kelvin. <clears throat> and so you just add 273 to each of these. We're not gonna add 273.15 because there's no decimal anyway. So if you convert 18, you'd get 291 Kelvin. And if you convert um, 85, you get 358 Kelvin. There we go. Now we can plug in some numbers. Our initial pressure is 1.20 atmospheres. Our final temperature is 358 Kelvin and our initial temperature is 291 Kelvin. Look at this. The units of temperature, Kelvin cancel, and we're left over only with atmospheres. Always include your units when you're working things out on an exam. Okay, it's imperative that you do that. Now let's double check the math here. 1.2 times 358 divided by 291. Here we go. We get a, uh, a pressure of 1.48 atmospheres which makes total sense, okay? So again, this is what I call gay Lussac's law. Again, our book calls it Charles' law. Charles' law, he puts both of them together. All right, well, let's move on and let's look at this one here. So this law that we looked at already tonight, okay, P1 times V1 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over T2, that can also be derived from the ideal gas equation, can it? Right? If we solve for PV over T, we see that it's equal to MR. Now, if those are constant, right, we can derive the relationship that is right here. And we call this the combined, combined gas law. That's what this is called. 
okay, the combined gas law. So it enables us to um, use three variables at a time here. So it says a small bubble rises from the bottom of a lake, maybe a fish made the bubble or something, anyhow, where the temperature and pressure at eight degrees Celsius and 6.4 atmospheres, the bubble rises all the way to the water's surface where the temperature is higher and the pressure is lower. Calculate the final volume of the bubble if the initial volume was 2.1 milliliters. Now, does anybody have a knee-jerk reaction based off of reading this equation or reading this um, question? If we're going from low temperature to high temperature, and then we're going from high pressure to low pressure, is the volume of the bubble going to be greater or smaller than 2.1 milliliters? What's going to happen to the volume? Will it increase or decrease? I would think you'd be able to answer that one pretty quickly. Maybe not do the math in your head. I wouldn't expect you to do that. But does anybody have a feeling about that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to increase for sure, right? Because we're doing a double whammy. Not, o not only are we increasing the temperature, and we know that pressure, this is something we've looked at already tonight. We know that pressure and temperature are directly proportional. Right, so if the temperature goes up, or sorry, we know that volume and temperature are directly proportional. So if the temperature goes up, the volume's going to go up. All right, and we know that volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So if the pressure goes down, the volume's going to go up. So the volume is going to go up for both reasons, okay? For both of these reasons that I have here. Okay, well, let's do some math here. So if we call this our initial, oops. If we call this, where's my pen? If we call this our initial temperature, we'll call that our T1. I've already gone ahead and taken the liberty of converting that into um, Kelvin. So if you take uh, 8 degrees Celsius plus 273, right, you get 281 Kelvin. Our final temperature, our T2, is 298 Kelvin. Our pressure is good. We just want to convert our volume into liters. So maybe I'll do that over here. So we'll say um, volume, the initial volume is 2.1 divided by 1,000. I'm not going to write that out. I'm assuming that you know how to do that by now. However, I'm going to leave it in milliliters instead of converting it into liters, which would be 0 0.0021. And I'm going to show you why. Because we're asked to calculate the volume in milliliters. And milliliters and liters are directly proportional. It's just a factor of a thousand. And so we don't have to convert those. All right. So now we're going to solve for the final volume, V2. So you've got to be able to do a little bit of algebra here. P1 times V1 times T2 is equal to, or sorry, P1 times V1 times T2 divided by T1 times P2. So now we can plug in some numbers. We have 6.4 atmospheres times our initial volume, which was what? 2.1 milliliters multiplied by 298 Kelvin divided by the initial temperature, which is 281 Kelvin multiplied by the second pressure, which is 6.4. Nope. The pressure decreases. There we go. 1.0 atmospheres. There we go. Let's double check our units. Kelvin cancels as do atmospheres, and we're left over with milliliters. And so that's why I didn't have to convert that into liters. Anyhow, we get that our initial volume is equal to, so let's see here, 6.4 is 2.1 times 298 divided by 281. There we go. And I ended up with 14. Since we should only have two sig figs, since we've only got two here and two here, so we end up with 14 milliliters, which totally supports our hypothesis based on Charles Law and Boyle's Law. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me thus far. And if you're like, you know what? This isn't half bad. You know, just uh, ideal gas law, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law, Gavin Sachs Law. As long as I know the law, you know, usually students don't struggle with these a lot. As long as they understand the laws and they're able to do some conversions, the students are usually pretty solid on these, okay? Let's take it one step further, okay? I want to show you how density is related to um, 
how density is related to the ideal gas equation. Okay, now I have a lot of the math done here already, and there's not a ton of room. I didn't leave myself a lot of room on here, but I just want you to follow me a little bit. Maybe I'll blow this up a little bit here. So if I have PV is equal to N times RT, then notice that this slide is titled density and molar mass. If I was to ask anybody in this class, what's the formula for density? Right, you all know that density is equal to mass over volume, right? There's nobody here that doesn't know that equation, and I can write it here, density is equal to mass over volume. I'm sure you've all got that memorized, you know, you could recite that in your sleep. Well, what if I did this? What if I rearranged the ideal gas equation to be N over V is equal to P over RT, right? I just solved for N over V. Well, what is N, right? N is the number of moles, right? Number of moles. But how would I get M? Well, another way to describe M would say that N is equal to mass, right? The mass in grams divided by molar mass. Remember we saw that tonight when we looked at that problem that dealt with the ammonia? So look at this. N is equal to M, little m, we call that little m over big M, like this. So mass over molar mass, right? Because the gram units are going to cancel. I'm going to be left over with moles. Now, what if we plug this in here for the N? Watch what happens. Now the equation is going to look like this. It's going to be mass over volume times molar mass is equal to pressure divided by RT. Recognize anything in here? Absolutely. Mass over volume is the same thing as saying density over molar mass is equal to P over RT. Now, if I solve that just for density, I get the density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by R times T. I'm not going to ask you to derive this equation. However, you will be responsible for knowing this equation, okay? The density is equal to pressure times molar mass over R times T. Now, depending on the textbook, some textbooks like to just use this formula here, which is just rearranging this, okay, and solving for molar mass, right? It's going to be DRT divided by P. Either way is fine. But I can tell you that if you understand where the formula is derived from, I've been helped so many times in my life on exams when I was too tired or just didn't want to put the effort into memorizing some new formula. But as long as I knew where it came from, I could kind of figure it out. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on this derivation here, how I came up with this formula. Or if you're like, it makes sense, Mr. Dion, you know, I might not derive it myself, but at least it makes some sense. Good, good. I'm glad it makes some sense. Yeah. And it kind of makes you feel good because you're like, hey, I'm tying something that I know really well, density is equal to mass over volume. Everybody who hears the sound of my voice knows the formula. They might not have been able to spit it out. You know, N is equal to M over big M, but you all know that number of moles is equal to mass divided by molar mass. So if you have this knowledge and you know the ideal gas, ideal gas equation, you can definitely come up with that equation, okay? In fact, I recommend just taking a piece of scratch paper and trying it once or twice. And trust me, it'll be a rewarding thing. You'll be like, hey, that's pretty cool. I can, you know, I can do that. Yeah, it's a nice thing. So what does that tell us? You know, if you're like, okay, great, feel good equation of the year. Well, what's cool about it is that if you have the pressure and temperature of a gas and you know the identity of whatever the gas is, well, of course, then you're going to know the molar mass. Then you can calculate the density of it. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's very cool, as a matter of fact. All right. Now, something else I want to point out is that densities of gases, and I brought this up last lecture, that unlike liquids and solids where we use grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter, for gases, we use grams per liter. And the reason why is because gases have such low densities, the grams per milliliter, I mean, it's just such low numbers that it's hard to keep track of all the zeros, okay? What else does it mean? It means that if we knew the density of a gas, which you can measure pretty easily, okay, um, and the temperature and the pressure of the gas, you can figure out the molar mass. That's even cooler, okay? Now, if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dion, how would I measure the density of a gas? Well, if you had some kind of bulb, 
okay, glass bulb, like just imagine you had some kind of glass bulb like this and you have it hooked up to a vacuum, okay? Okay, if you have it hooked up to a vacuum, um, there are two C's in the way. If you have it hooked up to a vacuum and you remove all the air from it and then you fill it up with the gas, okay, and you measure the mass before and after, then you can figure out what? The mass of the gas and you know the volume of the flask, so therefore you can figure out the density. So as long as you have some kind of system where you can put an unknown gas in some kind of flask that you know the volume of, you can determine the molar mass of that unknown gas, which is a very cool thing, okay? Something that's very cool about chemistry is being able to identify unknowns, right? If you're interested, if you've ever heard of the field of forensics, think, what's that about? The whole thing is about identifying unknowns, right? Okay, anyhow, let's move on. I might be going a little slow here, so I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. This question just asks us, what's the density of carbon dioxide in grams per liter at 9, 0.99 atmospheres in 55 degrees Celsius? I'll go ahead and convert this into Kelvin. 55 degrees Celsius is the same thing as 328 Kelvin. I know you all know how to do that. And you saw the formula that I put in the last slide, which is density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by RT. Let's plug in some numbers here. We have our pressure, which is 0 0.990 atmospheres. We have our molar mass of our carbon dioxide. Now, you have to tally up the mass of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, and you get 44.01 grams per mole. If you're doing a practice problem at home and you know how to calculate molar mass and you don't want to spend the time to calculate the molar mass of every damn thing under the sun, just Google it. It'll come up immediately, and they're always correct, okay? So 44.01 grams per mole, okay, um, divided by the gas constant, which is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, moles per Kelvin. And then our temperature, which is 328 Kelvin, like that. Look at this. Is this not a beautiful thing or what? Love to check your units, okay? There we go. Atmospheres cancel. Moles cancel and Kelvin cancel. What are we left over with? Grams per liter, which is the units of our density. Perfect. When we plug all that spinach into our calculator, and I've done this one already. I can't help but double check myself. As I'm, sometimes I do these too fast. One, two, three, four, six times. There we go. I get 1.62. Good. 1.62 grams per liter. There you have it. You need to know how to get this formula. I'm not going to give you this formula. I'm not going to write the word memorize by it because I think that if you know PV equals NRT and density is equal to mass over volume and number of moles is equal to mass over molar mass, I think if you have those three, you'll be able to derive it. If you want to memorize it, be my guest. No problem at all. No problem with that at all. Some students like to memorize lots of things, and there's no harm in that whatsoever. Okay, let's take a look at example 5.9. It says, chemists synthesize some kind of green-yellow gaseous compound made of chlorine and oxygen and finds it's got a density of 7.71 grams per liter at 36 degrees Celsius. That's 309 Kelvin and 2.88 atmospheres. What's the molar mass of the compound? Well, the last slide, we saw this formula. Density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by RT. It's not that much of a stretch to solve for D. Sorry, M is equal to D times R times T divided by P. Let's give it a shot. We've got our density. It's given to us 7.71 grams per liter multiplied by the gas constant. Liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times temperature, which is 309 Kelvin. Divided by pressure, which is 2.88 atmospheres. Look at this. Let's double check everything here. Liters cancel. Atmospheres cancel. Kelvin cancels. What are we left over with? Grams per mole. And those are the units of molar mass. Molar mass is in grams per mole. So when we punch all that spinach into our calculator, we end up with a molar mass of this gas as being 67.9 grams per mole. There we go. 
The next one is kind of a challenging example. Um, in the interest of time, since it's already six o'clock, I might skip this one for now and we'll come back to it later. Why don't we take a short break? And what I want to talk to you about after is gas stoichiometry. So gas stoichiometry, which is basically just stoichiometry, but incorporating gases instead of just solids and liquids. So um, it's six o'clock, um, right on the nose. Why don't we take a five minute break? We'll come back and we'll talk about gas stoichiometry.